All right, so I left off with um, Upper Santa Hampton Police Department and um, Steve and Alex stealing uh, Alfonso's car. They leave Alfonso and they take off in his car. They turn themselves in to the Upper South Hampton Police Department uh, the next day. Um, and uh, it's around, I, I believe, 6 o'clock in the evening, around that time, 5, 6 in the evening. And they turn themselves in. Uh, Upper South Hampton Police Department is right down the street, as I said, a few miles down the street from Warrensburg. Uh, so you, they don't come here to Warrensburg Police, they go to Upper South Hampton Police Department. Um, this is the this is the exchange um, in court between um, Alex and um, this is the exchange here. This is in court, and this is uh, them discussing Alex and Steve turning themselves into Upper South Hampton Police Department. It's important. Um, question: Who was that? Answer. I met up with him, the detective. Question, this one right here? Answer, no, the other one. Question, that one, Officer Harold? Answer, yes. Question, all right, and you gave him a statement inside of Upper Southampton Police Department? Is that correct? Answer, yes, that's correct. All right, so, this is where we're gonna get into the backstory about this whole thing. It's, um, this is very important, this whole information here. This is, this is what I was talking about in the first video, the things that were going on behind the scenes that I didn't know about. But I was talking about things, and, um, and now, years later, obviously all these years later, um, it all makes sense to me. Um, Alex and Steve meet up with Officer Harold at Upper Southampton Police Department, they give him a statement. And uh, when they give him a statement, the initial statement, they recant that statement. Um, Alex makes a statement, and he basically says that Steve tells him that he fled with him, and that um, he tells Alex to that he was the one who actually called for the drugs, and um, that um, he states that Lisa was the one who said to go get a gun. So he makes this statement, then he recants it and says it was a lie, it never happened. But um, when I saw the statement, I initially thought the statement was a um, self-defense claim. That's what I think they were, that's my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that they were going down some type of a, um, uh, they were trying to make some type of a first uh, self-defense claim initially. And then he recants that whole statement. But, um, so they make this statement. So, and they turn themselves into Officer Harold. This is important. So, all right, um, this is the backstory here. So, uh, in 2006, this case was in 2007, October 16, 2007. In 2006, um, they're going to have a series of um, ruse robberies, and they take place in this same development. Um, when I got up there in 2004, I, um, I started to go around the development, the, the, the the township and see what problematic places we had. One of them was this development here and another one below it. Um, they were problematic, um, meaning that there were some issues with drugs and stuff like that. Um, no real crime, just drugs and things of that nature. Um, they tried to, when I first went up there, officers that were up there in, in the suburban department actually tried to tell me that that was like a project, which is not a project. Uh, these are not projects. Uh, I would show you, and I, would, I, I told these officers, I'll take you down in North Philly, West Philly, Southwest Philly, and show you what a real project looks like. Uh, eight buildings, high rises with 26,000 people in them. That's a real project. Um, these are not projects. Um, anyway, I go around and I start to find out what the problematic locations are, and there's a security outfit that's in this um, Bucks Landing apartment complex, and there's, just, there's, there's several officers that work there, they're armed security guards. And they have a sergeant, um, a supervisor. And I get to talk to him, of course, because I want to know, all right, you know, what's going on in these developments, and I want to talk to the people who are in there. So I tell this sergeant, who was from uh, Philadelphia, um, I worked in the area as a project in his area, uh, and we struck up a conversation, and I tell him, I said, look, uh, if anything happens in these developments, uh, and you're, you hear about it, I want you to call me and tell me what's going on. 
So he does. Um, he, uh, he calls me and tells me that, hey, this robbery's taking place. Uh, they're taking place down here, and it's uh, robberies with a uh, ruse robberies of a pizza delivery guy and a Chinese delivery guy. And he tells me there's a girl, and there's a female down here that's talking about it and telling him, and she's afraid to go to the police, she's afraid to go to Warmster the police. Wants him to relay the information to me. So I tell him, you know, stand by, I'll be down. I go down and meet with him. I tell him, look, will she talk to me? And she, he says, no, she's afraid of the Warmster police. And um, I tell him, well, all right, I want you to go in, I want you to, to ask her basic questions, who, what, where, when, how, and I want you to write it down verbatim. Whatever she says, I want you to write it down. As soon as you get done that, I want you to come, call me, and I'm gonna have you come to my, my headquarters. You know where it's at, I want you to report to my headquarters. So he does, he goes in, he talks to her, he gets all the information off her, and then he uh, writes it down, and he calls me, and he meets me at, at uh, our headquarters, Armstrong. So I bring him in, take him in the back, interview room, give him coffee, start talking to him, and uh, he starts to write down uh, everything that she's saying. Uh, written statement off him, he gives it to me. My sergeant, Sergeant Beluga, comes in, sits there with this for part of the in interview. I tell him what's going on, I get this information. So he's like, oh, awesome. So um, my memory, my recollections, and what I was talking about that night, the girl that I remember has given up the information about her then boyfriend is the victim. Lisa Diaz, that's who I remember. She's the one I remember and I recall as giving the information back then in 2006 about the Ruse robbery in Jobs. Steve and Alex plead guilty to these two Ruse robbery jobs. They plead guilty to these two armed robberies, right? I remember, and I, re and I said this that night, I remember those jobs as having real guns used in those jobs. And I remember that particular one. When, we, when I'm on scene here, and I start to get, start realizing who's who. I go back to headquarters in the days after, I start mentioning about not only that uh, Jessica Carmona is a suspect in this job, but I also start talking about Lisa Diaz, and I also start talking about Steve and Alex. Now, Steve and Alex were police informants for SIU and Officer Howard. Why I know that is because when I had these jobs here, I was gonna work those jobs. I had this case file, I pulled the case file, I put her information in it, I put her information in the file, but I didn't put it in the actual report because I told the sergeant that I was not gonna have her, her na name, I was gonna keep it confidential and not have her name go out. So I did that, I remember doing that. So I told him to go back and tell her that her information and her name wouldn't be given out in this job. So, I uh, pull a case folder, put everything in it, I leave, I go home. SIU comes in and they take the case. They pull my case folder and they take the case and they go out and they start working on this job. I go and I tell the lieutenant and I tell my supervisor, that's my job. These guys have been taking jobs from us and that's what they would do. They would come, they would pull your case folders, go into your case folders, take them. The things that they wanted, they would go to the lieutenant and say they wanted to do them and they would take the jobs. It, was, it didn't just happen to me, it happened to other officers. So it got so bad that my sergeant actually took our case folders and locked them away. Uh, or we wouldn't put that much information in our uh, initial Cody report, so they wouldn't know what we were doing. So, um, yeah, it's up there. So um, they pull the case folder and they go out and they start working on this job. Well, I go and I start talking to the supervisor and I tell the supervisor, hey, look, uh, no, I don't want them working this job. This is my job, I worked it. You know, I got the information, I want to do this job. The lieutenant, tells me, Lieutenant Springfield tells me, that, no, 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 John, they're working this job, let them work this job, because they have a relationship, they're working with these two, Steve and Alex are their informants. They work for them. You know, Asian government, whatever you want to do, they work for them, so they're CIs. All book informants, whatever you want to call them. They're working for Officer Harold and SIU. So, they start working this case. As they work this case, 2006, there's another incident that takes place. Shortly after there, there's another incident that takes place with an individual named Sean Sullivan. Now somehow, some way, in these robberies, credit cards are used uh, to shop in center, shopping mall, whatever. And these guys all go and they use these credit cards from these robberies. And they use them and a warrant's put out for Sean Sullivan. Uh, and he's picked up and he's brought into the police station. And while he's in the police station, he uses his brother's name 
and they release him to his mother. His mother comes, picks him up, takes him outside, realizes that it's not the brother, it's Sean, does not take him back in headquarters, takes him home. So there's a warrant, there's a misdemeanor warrant out for the mother. So where this comes in with Sean Sullivan is there's a shooting at Sean Sullivan's mother's house and Sean Sullivan is shot in the backyard and killed. Um, the officer said he has a BB gun, he pulls the BB gun on him twice, they fire 56 rounds, and they shoot and kill Sean Sullivan in his backyard. Well, this warrant that comes out for the mother, officers, SIU and the officers, and a, and a nighttime supervisor go out, the, the only uniformed supervisor, it's a corporal, goes out with them, these guys are all in plain clothes, they all go out, and the lieutenant's there as well, Lieutenant Springfield's on scene. They go out to the mother's house and they surround the house for a pre-dawn warrant, for a misdemeanor warrant for a mother. Um, they don't go for Sean. Their story is they go for the mom. They want to pick the mom up because they want to find out where Sean's at. So when they go to the house at around pre-dawn, six in the morning, it's still dark out, they surround this house. Their story is that they gain entry to the house, they go into the house, and while they're in the house, the mother says that Sean's not here, and there's an exchange, and it's interesting because some of the some of the verbiage is used. If I'm not mistaken, the mother, his, her face turns white. She's she's afraid. She's scared. Whatever. And uh, Sean allegedly yells something from a back bedroom and says he has a gun. Leave his mom alone. Something to that effect. So they call a barricade. So these officers surround this house, and during this surrounding the house, the property, with Sean having this gun, this BB gun. He goes out the back window, and when he goes out the back window, he points the gun at the officers, they fire a bunch of rounds. He runs to the middle of the yard, around the middle of the yard, turns and points the gun at them again. They fire more rounds. He goes to a back fence, tries to, shoot, uh, tries to go over the back fence, gets shot, and he ends up dying from his injuries. So 56 rounds are fired. Uh, four officers in the backyard. Uh, and it's, 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 this kid ends up dying. So, um, and it's interesting because SIU, Officer Howard was part of SIU, but there was also two other officers that were basically rookie officers that were new officers that were assigned to this unit. Uh, so, uh, I remember our, our, our squad was coming on that morning. So we were due to come in and work at 7 a.m. So we came in, everybody was coming in like around 6.30 in the morning. This is all going on, the shooting already had happened, just happened. And, this mother's house was right behind our police station. Literally, I mean, I want to say 25 yards behind that, behind the police station. You could run, we did, through the parking lot to the rear of the, the, uh, the, the mother's house. That's how close it was. So we were directed to go there. As soon as we came in, we got our stuff on, we went right out. And we were told to go around the front of the house while this is all going on. So we go around the front of the house and we're standing out in front of the house. And we're standing there for several minutes and then several minutes go by, several minutes go by. Our supervisor now gets angry and wants to know what's going on. So he goes over to Lieutenant Springfield standing in the street on the cell phone. And there's a heated exchange between him and the lieutenant. He's basically telling the lieutenant, you know, what are you doing here? What's going on? I'm gonna put my guys back on the street because I don't know what's going on and why are we standing out here? So inevitably, we're then told to go to the rear property. So we go to the rear property, I go to the rear property, I end up being put in the yard, of course. Uh, I'm shown the, B, the BB gun uh, and told to let nobody go in the yard. Uh, and uh, I remember there was, a, there was a clear crossfire. The officers were shooting at each other. It was a miracle that they didn't, they didn't shoot and kill each other. Uh, 56 rounds were fired at each other. It was just a, it was a total food war. Um, anyway, this kid gets killed. So, so that, that happened right after these robberies. They plead guilty to these robberies. Stephen Alex plead guilty to these robberies. They go out to Sean Sullivan's house. Sean Sullivan's killed. Right. Well, there's a lawsuit that's fired, filed, right? Now, we knew that there was a lawsuit coming because the officers would meet and then they would discuss the case and they weren't allowed to talk to us, but of course they would tell us that they were discussing the case with attorneys and that there was going to be this wrongful death lawsuit coming down. So this wrongful death lawsuit finally comes down right after this shooting. This shooting takes place on October 16th of 07 and October 24th of 07, I believe that's when the lawsuit finally comes through. So days after this lawsuit comes through. So these officers knew there was a lawsuit coming through. And it comes, it actually gets filed and comes through days after. Well, the attorneys that handle this case is a uh, Goslin and a McSwain. And they're both former federal prosecutors. Uh, 
I believe they're both former federal prosecutors. They handle this job, and um, they um, they file these this whole thing. So um, sometime during the course of this investigation that they're having. They find out information that isn't an issue that comes out that there's three witnesses. Three witnesses in these houses. It's a, they're single dwelling, single family dwelling houses. This is a, you know, this is a, a nice neighborhood. Things like this just don't happen. So when they hear all this yelling and all this stuff going on outside, the neighbors, of course, come to the windows and look out. And they see and hear all the stuff going on and they make statements towards that. And they say that, you know, they see, and they all basically say the same thing, that they see Sean Sullivan come out his back window hit the ground running, take off running through the yard. He's running through the yard, as they say, with his hands over his head, like he's swatting at bees. They don't see a gun, and they hear a bunch of shots, and then that's that, that's all they, that's all they see. So, uh, Mr. McSwain and, uh, and Mr. Gosselin, they, um, they get these statements, and they also, they, they, they question Officer Harold at, uh, at the hearing. And they ask him about this BB gun. And they ask him about this BB gun. Why? Because they want to know because they believe that they believe that the BB gun was 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 planted at the scene. That's what these lawyers think. This is what they this is what they think. So this is what they're saying. So they ask Officer Harold about this BB gun. And uh, they ask him if he recovered a BB gun in the days or so leading up to the shooting of Sean Sullivan. And he says no. And they present the court with a property receipt. And on the property receipt, if I'm sure how this goes, they, 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 they present the court with a property receipt, and on the property receipt is a BB gun, and on it, it has Officer Kyle's name with another officer. And they want to question him about this BB gun and this property receipt. And they're not allowed to do that. So um, this case, um, the Morrison Township ends up uh, winning this case. And um, uh, on the Sean Sullivan shooting, so they win this case. So why I'm telling you this whole thing is, like I just said, you know, you have Stephen and Alex, you have Officer Harold is involved in this case. Now, Officer Harold and SIU, they're involved in this case. Not only are they involved in it, but Officer Harold runs this job. He runs this case. He's the lead investigator. He's a patrolman. He's in charge of this case. We have detectives at Warmerston Township. The county detectives are sent out, right? McDonough and his partner to run this job. And they put Officer Harold in charge of this job, who has no experience at all. And he's running this job, this case, which is a total violation of our policies and procedures. Uh, and when I find out about that, I start complaining about him running this job. And I go back and I start talking to the supervisors and downstairs, the detectives, and I start telling them you cannot have Officer Harold running this case when they're his informants. You cannot have him doing that. And he's a patrolman. He can't be running this, this, this double homicide. So they tell me that he ain't doing none of that, that all he's doing is bringing him in. That's what I'm told, he's bringing him in. So it goes back to the whole upper Southampton the next day when they were brought in and they meet up with who? Officer Harold. So, I all right, all right, so I, 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 at that time, I thought, there's no way he's running this job, there's no way. I mean, they got all these detectives, and he's running it, you know, and he got no experience, and they're his informants, so, the, so, well, that's not what happens. He actually does run the job, he runs the case. He's running this whole thing, you know, he's running this whole entire case. So, he, he, he runs this case, and, uh, and, and as I just said, I believe, personally, I believe that it's my opinion, it's my opinion. These cases, were, are, everything's linked here. And this is all linked in. I believe that when you have the 2006 uh, roof robberies, the setups, and you have Stephen Allen's been guilty to these, and they do a few months in county jail, um, and then Sean Sullivan shot right after that, 2006, and then you have 2007, you have the double homicides here of Lisa Diaz, the one that I remember as being the one who gave information up about these robberies and you have officer harold the patrolman running this case in charge um this just to me this all i believe this is all connected all these things are connected here now um 
Officer Howard's running this case. Now, you have these two guys, Alex and Steve, that are confidential informants for SIU. They go away. They, they, they strike up a plea and they go to county jail for two armed robberies and they do a few months in county jail. When they get out, not too long after they get out, there is, in the PCRA, the Post Conviction Relief Act, there's all kinds of um, threats. And um, they pull guns on her, I'll go into it, they pull guns on her, they, they kidnap her with a gun, they do all these things leading up to then she finally gets killed. So this is all an escalation of violence all the way up to where she gets killed on October 16, 2007. None of this information, none of this stuff that I'm telling you here right now that I remember and I recall ever came out in this case. None of this has ever come out about them and the CIs and this and Sullivan. You know, and again, I believe that these are all linked in. And also how run in this case, we shouldn't be running this case. You know, I, I just think that these cases and everything here is linked in. That is my personal opinion on this job. And that's why I believe that that's why now looking back and, and wondering, I knew there was a problem that night. I knew there was an issue. I knew there was something wrong because why are you sending me back to headquarters when I'm out there actually, you know, command and control running a job? And I just couldn't understand it because I was given an order. I was given a direct order. Back when I first started in 2004, and I was brought up by Lieutenant Springfield and Donnelly, who worked in the city as well, but Lieutenant Springfield was the one who recruited me up. I had a sit down with, uh, with Lieutenant Springfield, and he brought me in, and he told me about a case in 1993. It was a West Coast video job uh, in 1993, and it was a double murder in uh, Warmester Township. And um, he, he explained to me that what he wanted me to do was if I had any serious uh, cases, murder, they don't have a lot of murders. They rarely have murders or violent crime. But if I have any serious crimes or anything, he wanted, he gave me an order. He told me to take charge of the scene. And if I'm there, I run the job the way I was trained and taught. And if I had any problems or any issues with any of the supervisors, to bring it to the attention of him. And he, he told me, it was, he gave me an order. Well. It was funny because this 1993 job, and he told me about that job, and he told me that it was this, 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 these murders, these two young 20-year-old kids at this West Coast video, and that, um, you know, and, he, and as he's telling me this job, he tells me it's, you know, it's still unsolved, and he, he tells me that all the mistakes that were made, you know, basically it's just a total food bar, and he tells me that, uh, you know, he doesn't want these mistakes to be made, so, of course, I'm intrigued by the whole thing. I don't even know where the hell Warmester was, so I didn't even know nothing about no homicides. And again, they only had a few homicides over their, their whole existence. <clears throat> and these, these cases happen to be still unsolved. So I, of course, went downstairs and asked them if I could pull the file and look at it. So I pulled the file and looked at the case. And immediately when I'm looking through the case, it doesn't take long to realize that, that um, in my opinion, that um, there was a stage robbery. The 1993 case, if you look at it and you pull it up, it was a stage robbery. In my opinion, it was a stage robbery. You know, the CCT, C, CCT TV cable hate, cables to the rear, the surveillance cables in the rear of the building were cut. You know, I, I mean, it, their whole uh, scenario, this whole case back then was, and it still is, is that there was a, this was a, um, um, a robbery by some individuals that just happened by this location, came in, robbed this, 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 this store and killed these kids. And, um, you know, it was just a target of opportunity. And I just, I, I did not see that. I, I personally, when I looked at the case, uh, I thought that it was a, um, it was a state robbery. And um, uh, it, it just, it, it, it just, did, to me, it just looked like that. But again, uh, what do I know? But uh, they didn't take any money off the kids. Kids, each, each one of them had hundreds of dollars on them. They were stabbed with a large knife. I mean, it, you know, again, a knife is personal. I mean, um, uh, the one kid, Campbell, I believe Campbell was the kid who was targeted. That's just my opinion. He was targeted. Um, he had asked his friend who had just started working there. Um, apparently the story was with his friend just started working there and he came into work that night by accident. And he comes into work by accident and then he hangs around, stays with him. That's why he's there. And then, you know, unfortunately he's there and he gets killed. But I, I, when I read the case, I didn't see that. I saw that, you know, Campbell had some kind of an issue with something or somebody and was threatened. And I took it as that, no, no, this kid didn't come in by accident. That I believe personally, my opinion is he called, he called his friend Benson. His name was Benson. He told him to come in because these kids had trained in karate their whole life. They, they were they were close friends. I believe that Campbell. This is my opinion. That Campbell was being threatened by somebody, and then Benson came in and, and stayed with him that night. 
and then and unfortunately both of them got killed so i don't know so again with that case it just yeah whatever but i remember that whole thing sitting down with sarge and, and sergeant springfield at the time who became a lieutenant telling me about that case you know and, I, and it just it seemed to me to be a stage robbery or whatever it's just, you know it's just my opinion what do i know uh again what do i know I, yeah whatever so um all right so this is like the backstory with all that so yeah so you got a lot of things going on here I'm gonna go into some of these other videos. There's so much stuff, but I'm really gonna go into a lot of the stuff again with Jessica and her gunshot wound. She's not shot. I'll go into the whole thing. I'll have the, the, all the, the, the injury reports with the doctors. I'll go into the, um, um, the statements from the, uh, the coroner. I'll go into the, um, the um, uh, firearms expert who testifies that the shot's taken down here. Uh, the coroner testifies that the shot's taken down here. I mean, it, all this nonsense and all this stuff and her and being a hero and all, you got to, you got to, obviously you got to have somebody to be a hero, somebody likable. And I'll go into all that. I'll tell you all about that. But uh, I'm just going to wrap it up there and uh, and then we'll go into uh, some of the other things uh, involved with this case. And, and again, like I said, her hiding the gun. I believe she hit the gun, is my opinion, but I'm going to explain exactly why I think she hit the gun and what she did. She didn't call right away. She runs back. She runs back here to go get the gun. I'll, I'll talk about all that. This case is very interesting. This case has got everything in it. It's got all this stuff. And my opinion is that all these things are linked. And that's why I was taking off this job. Because I went back and I started talking about Lisa Diaz. And I started talking about the informants on this job. And, I started, and, I, and the more I'm opening my mouth, the more I'm getting in trouble. The more, you know, right away, I can't understand why I'm sent back. And then Varakel is yelling at me for some nonsense. You know, when his people won't even go to the case. And now it all makes sense. All these years later, now it makes sense why I was taken off and why I was never interviewed. Because there was a lot of things going on, and they could not have me involved in this case talking about all this stuff. So what they do is they just push me out of it. They take me off the case, and then later I retire, you know, and then whatever, and then they come to my house. They, they came to me. I didn't come to them. You know, again, I'm making this video just for, for the victims, for these people. You know, for Lisa Diaz. I mean, I'm responsible for this girl. You know, if I'm right, and I'm right about this, and which that's what I believe. I'm responsible for this girl. I told this girl she would be all right. And what's happened? I mean, it's the first time I lost a freaking. I mean, it's not, it ain't the first time I. I mean, how many people lose this many people in their career? I mean, I had one other. The, the first video I talked about that wasn't my. That wasn't the DA's fault on that one either. Nobody thought that they would go out and murder that kid and the rest of them. But I mean, yeah, I, I get. A, I lose another one. Like I mean, in Warminster, I mean, in this township, this township, this ain't the city. I mean, this is as close to Mayberry as you can get. I mean, all around Warminster, you got multi-million dollar houses. I mean, this is a rich community. I mean, what is it, 96% white? I mean, the average median income up here in this whole area, these are wealthy people. So, I mean, you're gonna have this type of crime. They rarely got this, thank goodness, these people rarely got this type of crime. But to send me back, and then you take me off the case? I mean, you know, it's just, it's, it's ridiculous. It's, I don't know, I don't know, I, I just, but I really think that these things are linked in, but what do I know? I mean, you know, I'm just some, you know, good cop from the city. What, I mean, what do I know? <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's that's all I can pretty much say. I'm gonna wrap it up here, and I'm gonna have uh, the other videos talking about her. Uh, I'm going to Jessica again. All right, thanks.